The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92 000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hello and welcome to the Engine Room Podcast. My name's Andrew Rocks and over the next hour, we're going to work out what makes really good quality practices tick. And it's with great delight that I'm speaking with David Maloney from Yarra Lane today. Yarra Lane is a long-term established business, but has just put a bit of secret sauce in the mix the last year. So it's going to be really exciting to hear about where David's come from, how he has built the engine of his financial services group, and what he thinks of the future. So without any further ado, David, welcome to the Engine Room Podcast. Thanks for having me, Roxy. Cheers. And like all good podcasts, it's good to try and get a bit of a feel for, for who we are. And, and I actually um, did some you know obligatory stalking, and you must have wanted to be a financial planner from the get-go because you're one of the very rare people who studied financial planning, Bachelor of Financial Planning at RMIT. So maybe with that in mind, give us a bit of an idea of how you've come to be where you are today. Ah, thanks, mate. Yeah, so we're uh, we're a small cohort. Uh, back at uni, there was thousands of business graduates, um, but we were only twenty. Good That's how small financial planning was at the time. Yeah, spot on. And um, it was part of the great economics and finance uh, degree. But yeah, we drilled down into financial planning. So at the time, I'm not sure if I've got the right terminology, but we could walk out of our degree and be IG one four six compliant. So that was the idea at the time. And um, of those 20 people uh, who did that course, um, did most of them find their way into um, financial services? It's a good question. I think I was probably one of a handful left, really. I think most have left um, the industry, which is interesting. So, uh, yeah, obviously people are coming in from uh, other areas, but from our degree, yeah, quite a few left. And so, so, so you've walked out, you've got your financial planning badge, you're RG, you're all excited. Um, yep. It's 2005 or six. Um, yep. Take me through how you've gone from there to um, overseeing one of um, Victoria's and Australia's larger financial services companies. Yeah, I look back now, it was a bit insane, but uh, I was 22 uh, and decided to start a practice. So I finished my degree, started a financial planning practice, as well as a mortgage practice at the same time. Um, it was the peak of the mining boom, 2007. And uh, the GFC was soon to follow after, but uh, a fascinating time. Um, we saw a lot of the practices that struggled in that time. Um, we learned a lot from what not to do. Um, so I'm forever grateful for starting at that time, even though you look back on it and it was absolute chaos. Um, no one knew what was going on ultimately. Um, but as a young individual, it was uh, really helped shape us going forward. And you mentioned you also um, started a mortgage broking business. Was that something that you, yeah. you, you you kicked off almost from the outset? Yeah. So um, we set up an office just on Collins Street, right near the legal precinct here in Melbourne. And the target demographic I was going after were barristers. Um, the, the thesis there was they're all self-employed, so they needed advice. 
Um, there was no SG, uh, obviously, for a lot of these people, and they needed a lot of cash flow and debt advice. Uh, I'm still forever grateful for a good friend of mine uh, to this day, a gentleman by the name of Morgan McClay. He's a barrister. Um, but he really got me in front uh, of a lot of barristers um, back in 2007, um, and they're still a big part of our business today. And um, how did you get through the GFC? You mentioned that it was hard, but what were the things that you put in place? And was it potentially that you you had a fallback um, business or income stream in the mortgage side that, that assisted? Yeah, exactly. Um, to be frank, we obviously hadn't accumulated a lot of clients at, at that point in time. It was all organically grown. It was more a lesson in what not to do, um, and it's sort of shaped the way we run our business today. So we were able to avoid a lot of the mistakes. Um, the mistakes I could easily see happen to most people, uh, but because it happened to us at that particular point in time, um, yeah, it was a great lesson. But the, the mortgage business was thriving. Um, what what were some of the mistakes that you've, 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 you've like? Give me some examples of the mistakes that, no doubt. You're going to say, and everyone who's listening is going to nod and go, yep, I did the same. Yeah, so um, obviously the big thing at the time was um, a lot of things like commercial property trusts that became illiquid. They were potentially promoted as being defensive when they weren't. Um, having a clear-cut um, investment strategy. What I did take away and what we do uh, implement now is the ability to be nimble and to move quickly. Um, and having the right structures in place to move quickly. I think a lot of advisors at the time, and this could be technology-driven as well, just couldn't move quickly enough. Even though they thought uh, the right move was to take action, they just simply couldn't do it. So that's really important for today well, as well. pretty hard to move your, your property trusts when they freeze them, right? So well, I think... Uh, oh, yeah. Um, well, um, avoid um, that one. We're, yes, we're, uh, we're, 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 we've all felt that, that pain. And yeah. so um, after that, um, did you stay in, in, in Melbourne in the city and did you stick with, 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 with barristers or what did your business evolve to? Yeah, so um, it was a one-man uh, shop. Um, I grew that as much as I could and then um, we were operating off an independently owned um, AFSL. And a colleague of mine, Christopher Guy, was doing something similar. He was targeting more uh, allied health professionals. Um, we ultimately found that we were doing uh, similar work. And in 2011, um, we merged our practice and we created a business called Avant Guard uh, Financial Services. Uh, and we really drilled into the wealth management, cash flow, debt management, the mortgage business, and also a commercial insurance business. What, what do you mean by commercial insurance, David? Yes, yeah, so outside of typically home and contents, um, commercial insurance, um, which are things like business packs, um, all businesses require uh, insurance, um, and I was putting together insurance programs uh, for businesses rather than individuals. I think, you know, um, the financial planning industry has historically been excellent at life insurance, um, yeah. But uh, general insurance has been something that they almost left for the accounting fraternity to, to cover off, and um, Spot on. having having uh, even just above average skills in 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 working with uh, your, your referral partners, um, yep. you know, leads to a lot of goodwill. Um, it it's does. as crazy as it sounds. Uh, uh, you know, you're going to insure your factory every year. Um, exactly. Sometimes you probably should be insuring yourself at the same time, but you know the way that priorities are right in front of you. Um, it's something that gets gets paid for every year. No, spot on. And, and uh, it's extremely complicated when, when you see some of these uh, insurance programs being put together and, and being able to place that risk somewhere. Um, it's a highly skilled uh, profession and something where you need a lot of nows and uh, insight. But it's, um, it's a great business and a great business we still enjoy today. Now you mentioned you've, you you you, you uh, sort of hooked up with Chris Guy. He's, he's a great yep. great bloke, um, mm. but effectively it sounds like you're both doing the same job, right? So you're both doing the Spot same on. job. What we differed was was uh, the clients that you, you targeted, um, um, being yep. legal and and and, and medical. Um, and yep. this is an engine room podcast. So yes. um, how has the roles that you both have now evolved, and um, where do you find yourself uh, today? Yeah, so fast forward probably a few years ago, um, uh, Chris and I, um, we built out uh, our business and we merged um, with a group called uh, JPH. Um, and that was a 40-year business targeting uh, pharmacy professionals typically. And what we found was there was a lot of uh, common thread 
um, in the business. Every client was a business owner, um, professional. Um, so the business lines were uh, very similar. Um, our roles today are very much managerial. We did run with what we called a, a multi-brand strategy uh, a few years ago. Um, we did some acquisitions. So we had the avant-garde business, JPH. We had a Macon and Kinsey, which was a law firm. Um, but ultimately, it became a bit too convoluted and confusing. And what we needed to do was to rebrand. Uh, that was a 10-month process. Um, we had a lot of consultation. We had a fantastic group uh, called ET Collective, an agency uh, that put everything together for us. Um, could not have done it without them. Um, we went through a lot of names, um, ultimately settled on Yarra Lane. Um, we, we think it's a beautiful name. It ties into our roots um, as Melbournians. Um, but uh, Yarra is a fantastic Indigenous word for you know river and flow. Um, we like to think that we go with the flow of um, our clients. And Lane... It's a bit of a homage to Melbourne as well, but Lane also represents structure, and that's what we ultimately give to our clients. Um, we go with the flow, but we give them structure as well to help them achieve their goals and objectives. Um, so we love the name. We've got the collective group now under that one banner. Um, the messaging is very clear, um, and it allows us to go into um, uh, the next realm. Uh, we, we did grow from approximately 30 staff uh, three years ago. Um, we're now seeing it about 80. Um, so we've had rapid growth un- under that name, um, and that's been a, a, a big part of it. Well, um, thanks for sharing the story about Yarra Lane, the name there. It's uh, um, at Ensemble. We've recently yep. uh, you know, made a, a, a change of name and a transition, and, and the emotional attachment and the rationale, um, there has to be buy-in. Um, I think yeah. the way that you explained it there, uh, is is a real sort of centering point, I imagine, yeah. for whenever you're interviewing new people and and for what you're looking to achieve. And it's probably also a part of a filter for any yeah. additional acquisition that you're doing. So I, I thought I might um, sort of change up gears because the Yarra Lane of today, um, which is um, if you look the website up, uh, you guys are unabashed. Yeah? You're, you, you've targeted a specialist industry. Um, that uh, that industry of, of pharmacy um, yeah. has been hyper-targeted. And, and just give us a bit of a feel for where you sit um, in the industry when it comes to advising medicos and in particular pharmacists. Yeah, look, a- a- ourselves, um, we, we probably are in the top two, three uh, in terms of service providers um, nationwide, we believe. Um, definitely in Victoria um, for pharmacists. A big contingent, obviously, is uh, part of the chemist warehouse uh, group. But outside of that, um, uh, we are a, a big player. We did make an acquisition in the pharmacy uh, space, um, Beeswax, um, which is a pharmacy bookkeeping business. They solely take care of uh, pharmacies. And what we hope to do is to keep building out that service offering to focus on pharmacists. Um, and and what makes them so good? What, 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 so, so, you know, to have 80 people in a practice yep. is a big practice yep. and yep. to have one segmented target client base is a small yep. number. Yeah. So what makes yep. them so wonderful? They're probably going to listen to it. You want to be nice? <laughs> no, but, uh, firstly, they're fantastic people. They're, I mean, I think they're one of, it's always chops and changes, but um, probably one or two in terms of trusted professionals in the community, hence why they're typically justice of the peace. They're great to deal with. Again, they're self-employed um, and they need a lot of advice. Um, they tend to be extremely focused on their practices and they need someone in their corner to ultimately help them. So but that, that's always the key driver, people that are willing to engage, uh, people that want to succeed, they've got a growth mindset, but also a willingness to serve. So that's aligned with us as people and our business as well. And from an outsider looking in, the typical pharmacy definitely has a, a medical professional aspect to it, but yeah. most pharmacists also have a range of other services that they provide within the four walls that you have to walk through. Um, yeah. Everything from I've seen I've seen post offices in there. Uh, I, I know Shut that Dar- Daryl Lee um, seems yeah. to be, uh, <laughs> in, in, which which by the way is awesome. Um, but you know, so effectively they're, they're they're a retailer as well. So when you're doing exactly. and, and that's probably. The complexity of bookkeeping as opposed to a, a standard medical uh, sort of um, services industry is that is mm. that they are effectively a retail operation as well. 
They are. They are. And, and uh, just like any business, you need to ensure that you, you diversify and have multiple income streams. And that's just prudent uh, business practice um, to have those other income streams. So just getting a bit of an idea of the, of, of the practice, you've, you've, you mentioned there's it's 80 people strong. Um, mm-hmm. The component that, that you you run and operate being the financial planning part um, yep. of Yarra Lane, um, how do you structure that? I mean, do, uh, how many ARs do you have? Uh, what what Who do they look after? What's kind of the, the way in which you run that? Because I imagine you've got a fair bit of uh, efficiency and competitive pressure from your accounting division to get things done, from your mortgage division. You know, everything's interlinked because, as you mentioned, Correct. that one client has a continual requirement for those yes. multidiscipline advisory points. Spot on. Um, so we, to answer your first question, we've got uh, eight ARs, um, and within that we've got a support team of probably another eight. Yep. Um, so it's a great uh, business. Um, one thing that's in the DNA across our entire practice, and in particular in the financial planning business, is the holistic nature uh, or view of all the advisors or consultants we do take a one view uh, of the client. Um, to help us manage that, we use a bit of software called the Stute Wheel. It's very neat. It gives uh, a 360 view uh, of the client, which every division taps into. Um, doesn't matter if you're a mortgage broker, an accountant, a lawyer, um, a bookkeeper. Um, we use that uh, that service or that system to have a full view of the client. And it really allows us to identify things that are coming up um, for instance, a liquidity event, a small business CGT uh, event, um, what are the implications? Um, because often these things have not just an accounting implication, it's a financial planning, a debt implication, a legal implication. So we're all well-versed um, uh, in treating the client as one. And I look at your business and it very much is a circle because when you get to the end, you start again, right? Because yeah. um, you know things happen, life happens. Um, typically, where, where where's the entry point? Um you know, are you, is it the financial advisors also have the role of, of, of the first impression or does that come from the accounting business, the mortgage business or, or where's, the, where's the first entrance into this, into this group? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question and I think it's a benefit of having a, a dynamic uh, business but uh, people will have an accounting need. They, they set up a business, there's a, a clear accounting need um, and that's where the first trusted advisor kind of comes in. Um, Sometimes it's from the mortgage business where they need to buy into a practice. They need to get their finance structures right. The mortgage team could potentially be the trusted advisor in that instance. Sometimes with financial planning, there might be a, a particular event. You know, sadly, someone might have a heart attack or something along those lines. But you know, yeah. we come in at that point, so uh, it doesn't really matter um, where uh, that point comes in. It does literally come from uh, everywhere. And do you feel now that you're um, moved from a multi-brand strategy to a, a, a one-brand strategy? Do you feel that the, the 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 feeling between the divisions of of sharing clients faster of of teamwork has has enhanced, or is it something that you still need to work on? It's something um, we always probably need to work on, but we believe that is the key to our success. We're, we're quite good at it, um, we're proficient at it, but we're continually looking to improve that. Um, one of our key corporate pillars is obviously the client experience and and being digital first. Um, so we're working on a lot of things to help enhance uh, that interlinked relationship. Pasquale, who's in our operations of our business, he's got this concept of, you ever saw the 90s movie, The Concierge? Um, we've got all these concierges within each division and they help facilitate um, leads, advice uh, throughout the group. So... And they kind of meet together as a as a group as well. Look, when when a a business that focuses on pharmacists um, yep. says they're digital first, considering that pharmacists are the only people that can read doctor scripts, then I think the world has bloody changed. Um, <laughs> yep, spot on. So um, we'll come back to Pasquale in, in, in a second because where he fits uh-huh. into uh, your engine room across your business because yep. it is a unique. Yep. Story that I, I'd like to um to, to flesh out. Um, just getting back to your advisors, you, do you have eight ARs and, and eight support people? Are they running pods? Mm-hmm. Do they look after a certain number of family units? Have you got like people coming through at different age groups? Give us a bit of a feel for the the, the how dynamic your team is. 
Yeah, spot on. We did initially start with a centralized system um, and we have moved to a, a, a pod system. What we wanted to ensure that as we grow, we still have a very personal relationship with our clients and we didn't want it to feel like um, our clients were uh, another number. Um, so we segmented the team into different pods where our clients got the same client services officer, same power planner, same advisors, and ultimately the same team managing them all the way through um, rather than having this centralized uh, process. It also allows us to conceptualize how we can scale up um, if we need to. Um, and breaking things up into pods, you get your ratios right, you get your revenue metrics right. Um, we find that it's, it's really working well for us. So, um, yeah, that's something we've recently started. And so what's your ratios um, uh, today and where would you like them to be? be? Be very interested in that. Yeah, so in the financial planning business, we're hovering, a, uh, are you talking about our profit margins? No, no, just, we'll just, mar- just, <laughs> just client numbers. They're all smart cookies on here. They can work it out if they if they think long and hard enough about it. But just, just the ratios yeah. of, of, of the... The, the pods that you've got and the um, the, the clientele n- by number. Yes, yeah, spot on. So we our pods are broken up into two advisors per pod. Um, they share a power planner, they share a client services officer, and um, also there's an assistant to our client services officer. Um, so that's the configuration of uh, each of our pods. We think that works for us. Um, and it allows some sharing of resources rather than having one advisor that ultimately gets one of everything. Um, we think that works well for us at the moment. But the only way you're going to grow is is each one of those pods needs to be able to manage more people or you need to grow more pods. So Correct. where are you at both of those points? You raise a good point. I think, yes, we can probably get more out of those pods. Um, in our, we recently did a staff um, survey and one of the key things that were coming out of it was that they're probably feeling a little bit overworked. There's a lot of volume coming through. So we are actively looking at ways of improving our efficiency. And one of them is automation, um, where our staff can actually focus on more things uh, for the client and the things that they're less enthusiastic about doing. Um, we do get robots ultimately um, to do that work. So if we can get that right, um, I, I think we can get more out of our pods for sure. And I think the combination of, of technology and also um, people who've got scoped operational skills is, is useful. Yeah. Um, now, uh, how do you measure success with your uh, uh, with your pods? What's what's uh, what success look like? And um, uh, by the way, you're not Robinson Crusoe when when uh, people feel overworked, um, especially yep. in the delivery of financial advice or the engine room. We're coming off ten years. Of every every external um, piece of legislation or, or or influence in financial planning has meant that there's more work for the same Spot outcome. On. So um, I do hope we have a tailwind soon. But um, you know, um, how how do you measure success? Yeah, obviously there's uh, several um, things that we look at. Um, there's the commercial drivers. Um, so that's something that keeps us all employed and um, coming to a happy place. But Importantly, um, we do want to build a business that everyone is proud of. Um, that's something where we do want to promote in the sense that do they enjoy work? Are they happy to refer our business to their friends, uh, as an example? Um, we can measure that success um, through surveys, direct feedback, but also um, our clients um, feeling proud of you know being associated with us and, and continue to work with us there's probably no better feeling than um and you still get a kick out of it today um when you work with clients and they ultimately say you know thank you or um a bit cliche but it's still what makes you get out of bed yeah well i mean that's coming from a guy who who, who picked financial yeah. planning as his, as his degree so yeah. um yeah. you know this is not a johnny come lately kind of a vocation for yourself um Spot on. i'm really interested in how you deliver advice um yeah. So you, you've got a big business by number. Um, yep. You've still got to be doing SOAs, ROAs. You've still got to be, yep. you know, adhering to all of these things. Do you? Yep. Um, is it in, in, is it completely in house? Is it out house? Uh, do you do you have contractors? Do you, you know, how do you run that that advice delivery, which is yep. um, sort of 
the necessary engine to run the bit of the business which which cascades up. And uh, having a previous business that was multidiscipline myself, um, yeah. the amount of work that goes into getting a dollar in financial planning, especially when you look across the fence to um, some of your other disciplines, um, you must Spot just on. sort of uh, roll your eyes in, in, in your management meetings. <laughs> Spot on. Yeah, and uh, sometimes my business partners ask, you know, why can't we deliver this a bit quicker and uh, a bit more cost-effectively? But, um, yeah, they've got to see the components. And you're right, there's a lot. To answer your question, our tech deck is probably uh, expanding. Um, we do use um, X-Plan. We see X plan and everyone's different, um, but we see it more as a data house. Um, things like data feeds, um, having a central point where everything can be fed into. The future for us, though, is a lot of things will plug into X plan. Um, a lot of things do communicate to that, and there's a lot of bespoke, um, specific bits of software that we can use um, to help with things like advice production, client portals. Got got any favourites, David? Uh, we're astute wheel is definitely one of them. Yep. We're, we're exploring uh, in that at the moment. Um, we are also um, I might be letting the cat out of the bag here, but um, we are also exploring uh, my prosperity uh, as something where we can um, enhance the the client experience um, through their portals. And um, just a bit of hygiene. How are you licensed? Um, you know, how does that operate? Yeah, so we were self-licensed, um, but a few years ago, we, we gave that up and we're licensed through Interprac, who have been a fantastic uh, partner, um, especially as you know we grow and we continue to focus on our business. Um, to have a partner that accommodates um, taking care of, uh, I guess, the compliance side of things uh, for our business, um, it does really free up a lot of our time um, to continue doing the things that we're trying to do. And given uh, Yarralane puts you firmly in Victoria and having a background of being the most locked down state on earth, um, <laughs> how has that sort of painted the picture of how you operate now with, um, you know, are you single location? Are you multi-site? Yeah. Do you have him, do you have team members uh, 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 interstate, overseas? Like, well, how has yeah. it informed you? Because there is a special sort of camaraderie that I find of a lot of Victorian firms on how they've harnessed and and I would yeah. say they've almost front run um, this this uh, out of necessity this movement yeah. into that that work from anywhere so how does Yarralane position itself right now and where do you think it's going to go um, we've got staff in every state um, unfortunately not the territories yet our office locations we have um, the main one is in St Kilda Road uh, in Melbourne um, we also have an office in Essendon, in the northern suburbs of uh, Melbourne. Um, but we do have staff all around the country. And every financial year and um, leading up to Christmas, um, we fly them all in and we all get together, um, which is fantastic. Um, but to cultivate our culture and to ensure everyone's kind of locked in and stayed um, or staying together, um, we do use platforms uh, such as Slack. Um, which are great for building rapport with others. Um, plenty of video conferencing um, uh, technology out there. We're all well uh, versed in that at the moment. Um, but yeah, Slack's been great um, from that perspective. And given your, and we'll come to we'll come to your team in a minute on how the, you yeah. run the people. And and uh, I just want to get a feel. But every state is is is. I suppose that there's pharmacies in every state. So why not be yeah. um, where where your clients are. Um, uh, do you operate, um, so given that you are multidiscipline, do you operate uh, a board or do you cascade up your information? If so, how does that work? And um, is that new or something you've always done? Yes, structurally, we, we, we do have a board where we've got a commercial partner in AZMGA who provide a, a lot of great governance uh, around that. It has really enhanced us as a management team um, to ensure that our governance um, is first class. Um, we can are I kind looking... of stop you for a second? Because the sure. stereotype of AZNGA is that they provide money, but you're just saying that that it's it's taught you and your incumbent team a bit about how to run the business of the business. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. I'm, I, I say this all the time. I'm an accidental manager. I, I started as a sole practice an individual, um, and now we find ourselves uh, managing 80 people. And 
AZ really give us um, a fantastic lens into how uh, good quality practices run. Um, Roxy, you're a testament to that as well. But they give us the structure, the governance. Our board really does um, make us accountable. And when things require scrutiny, they're scrutinised. Um, whereas in the past, something like that may never may never have uh, appeared. Yeah. So thanks for adding adding that about the board structure. When you when you're growing a business, your board meetings had whiteboards in them. But when yes. you've got a business partnership and you you're in charge of the hopes and dreams of eighty people, you have to pre prepare your documents. Things like pre reading comes into it um, because time is precious. Uh, exactly. And 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 on the engine room podcast we have. Uh, people of multiple different AFSLs, but also multiple different ownership groups. And there is an emergence around people who are looking to tap into the bits they're not as proficient in, whether that be governance and accountability, and bring to the table the things they are, which is you guys and having that hyper hyper sort of targeted marketplace. So Spoddle. let's talk about the, the people, 80 of them. Yeah. And, um, and I'm well aware that your 80 are, are here and you've got... You've got them all over the place. Um, yeah. But I would like to ask you a question. Why do people join you and Yarralane? Why do they stay and why do they grow? Timely question because we've got direct feedback on this right now. Um, I think a key part of our success is, um, and I'm glad to to report this, but our management team probably doesn't have uh, a clear ego. Um, so we're quite um, able to adapt um, to... Our staff's particular needs. Um, we do run a hybrid office, uh, which I think is uh, particularly important to a lot of people now. Uh, our management group is typically around 40 years of age, um, and we have staff on either side, so we sort of feel like we sit in the middle. Um, and a lot of our staff do have families, so flexibility is really important uh, to them. I think that's been a key part of our success, and I think also... Uh, the willingness to hear feedback, implement feedback. Um, we understand we're all not perfect. That they've probably been the big things, and I think our, our staff have referred us to other people. And and you mentioned the the hybrid principle. Mm-hmm. So we all got thrust into that overnight in 2020. Yeah. When you're recruiting new people, is it one of the things that comes up regularly when you're searching for talent? Um, yeah. So is it? Yeah, it, it is spot on. At the same time, we don't lose focus of we are a client service driven uh, business. So we've got to operate in a way which um, assists our clients. But um, we are more than willing to uh, accommodate a flexible working arrangement. Um, and uh, there wouldn't be too many people in our office that come five days a week, for instance. And the culture tether or, or the, the, that you use is, is via the Slack channel. Is that right? So. You've, your Slack performs a uh, an operational um, role in the business, but it also performs a, a socialization and, and, and peer-to-peer learning. Is that is that correct? Yeah, that's right. And we set up a lot of um, different groups. Um, one of the things that we try to promote is gratitude. It's one of our values. Um, and we've got a kudos channel. Um, so whenever someone within our business um, does something well, we, we want to call it out and let everyone know about it. So, Give me an example of the most recent one, Dave. Let's do some kudos for the kudos channel. What would be an example? Yeah, so uh, this is a general in nature, not general in nature, but uh, some ex- typical examples are someone's done a fantastic job. Of, often, like for instance, our solicitor, our mortgage broker, will be working on the one file together um, and... One of the other professionals will highlight that another professional did a really good job, and that they were impressed for you know whatever reason, and that that would happen daily, right? So that kudos channel is um, something that really gets utilised a lot. And given that you that you are one business ostensibly from the client's perspective, you're still four or five different professions, different disciplines, uh, but different historical educational uh, journeys. How do you arrange the business of of meeting rhythms? Um, yeah. So, firstly, for what what kind of meeting rhythms do you have within your financial planning business, and 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 potentially, if if you do, how does that cascade into the overall businesses? Yes, but actually, that's a a really good question because you could have anniversary dates across 
multiple businesses at different times of the year. So that's actually something that we're looking to consolidate, especially knowing that our clients are extremely busy. We do try to the best as we can to match up things like a tax meeting with a financial planning meeting and having what we call common renew dates. But that is something we are working on because you're right, uh, some clients might have four or five meetings throughout the year um, with different divisions. Yeah, and their time's precious too. And and maybe exactly. with that, I'll, I'll do a segue into t- tell me about um, tell me about your business partner, a Pasquale, mm-hmm. who's yep. come in via Beeswax, and just yep. a bit about what his background was and what he's doing in the business that's helping you get yeah. those common renewal dates and, and 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 join the business together. Yeah. So Pasquale, obviously, he is the head of our bookkeeping business um, and he is a highly processed and well-drilled individual um, and his uh, business or the the Beeswax business is um, efficiently run. His background is actually in pharmacy. Um, He was a pharmacist himself. He ran his own pharmacy practice. You've got got, got like a Trojan horse in the business. Yeah. Depends on how you look at it in a good way, um, but but, um, but uh, he um, he actually had a real scare. Um, he had, I believe, a heart attack um, at at a very um, young stage of his uh, career. My other business partner, uh, Nick Perrett, was his advisor at the time. Um, he encouraged him to get trauma cover. Um, he got paid out on that cover, but Nick literally stepped into his a pharmacy and kept the doors open and um, made sure the staff were paid, stock was coming through. And I, I guess that's one of those things where if you are community orientated, yeah, people sort of feel a little bit indebted. Um, but uh, that was a bit of a, a wake-up call for um, Pasquale where he felt that he wanted to do uh, something different. He had this great idea of setting up a pharmacy bookkeeping business um, and, and that's just grown uh, remarkably, he's got about 200 uh, pharmacies now uh, wow. nationwide, um, and he's done it in a very short period of time. Just just on that, one of the, the things that you've you highlighted was that um, Nick was was Pasquale's advisor, um, yeah. and uh, just the the power of of um, being insured properly. You know, we yeah. we start we are in financial services, and um, so uh, can you remember? Um, if you'd like to, can you remember who the company was who, who 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 actually paid out on the on the trauma cover? Is that knowledge to you or not? Yeah, in, in, uh, a missed opportunity here. I'm not quite sure who the insurer was. Well, so well a I'll, big I'll, shout I'll, out I'll to have... the insurers who are listening. <laughs> spot okay, on. Spot trauma on. cover um, yeah. done well has has not only um, uh, helped this this person and this family, but has spot spun on. around. And I'm sure that you guys generate a fair bit of insurance inquiries in your day to day. So. So um, it's 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 been a bit of a a, 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 a paid it forward moment for the for the insurers there, and just while I'm on that, um, although you don't focus tremendously on you know uh, being a specialist investment manager and whatnot, I still want to ask you, how do you run your investments? Do you do you do you have an MBA, an MDA, an SMA? What and and do you have any platforms that sort of work for you? Yeah, uh, we do. So uh, we went on the managed account uh, journey um, about five years ago um, and we were looking to, um, and and touching on earlier in our conversation around the GFC and so forth, but I never wanted to be in a position where we didn't know what was going on again, right? That that was a a key driver uh, for that. And we wanted to engage on us a consultant and we did establish uh, around four years ago um, an MDA, and we've partnered with uh, Philo Capital, um, and we at that time appointed, um, and still to this day is our ISA consultant, uh, Drum and Capital. Um, we were actually their first um, advisory practice um, many years ago, um, and they've in, in, in a climate where so much has changed in the last few years. Having a robust quality investment process, we've just never looked back. Our clients give us feedback. Um, every day at how fantastic it is. Yeah, we've been. It's been a great journey. Well, safe to say, if you're running 80 employees, the last thing you need is to also um, have pain around um, uh, double handling and running the investments as well. So, a shout out to the the Philo Capital and the, and the Drummond uh, people who are helping yep. uh, power 
the yep. Daryl Lane. And a question I like to ask also is, you know, what are the lessons you've learned? I think you just just summed it up. You know, mm-hmm. the, the, what the GSC taught you is that you 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 can't set and forget, and you need to be mm-hmm. nimble, um, because that's yes. what your clients are paying you for. Um, and uh, moving to an MDA um, that many years ago and employing professionals, uh, no doubt has assisted you um, with your clients um, come review time, but also, yep. uh, as you say, it probably gives them a bit more sleep at night because they know that, that you can be quite responsive if anything's happening. It, it, exactly. And, and, and just structurally, it's a different mindset when an asset consultant is accountable to a business right in, in a world where you know you get given what you're given with a product the the dynamics completely shifted here uh, they know that they have to deliver on their mandate in order to maintain the mandate right um and they've been doing such a fantastic job um and that's where i just and this is probably uh becomes more and more um, highlighted in, in our minds uh, around governance but having the right governance in place where we can structurally change things um, on behalf of our clients as custodians of their uh, wealth and their financial positions, um, we've got the right governance in place and getting the right people managing our, our clients' money. Where Yarralone is today is that you've, you, you, you've somehow got four or five uh, different businesses that have come together. You've got the common name. You did mention that people like you got like, – your team like you because there's a perceived lack of ego, but you divide a dollar every time five self-made people came together to try and um, to try and run that. Um, well, congratulations that you've got this far. Yep. But if you guys are all in your early forties, um, which yeah. is the average age of a financial planner these days, um, yeah. what's the next step? Have you got a, a plan to to bring uh, team members in all the different disciplines through? Um, you know, do you do you have an employee share scheme? Is there, you know, now that you've 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 managed to somehow <laughs> all still talk to each other under the common thing and, and actually flourish, what's the next steps for you guys structurally, and and how do you think that's going to be implemented? Yeah, we touched on it uh, slightly uh, before, but um, we're establishing our corporate pillars at the moment, which are all aligned um, to our corporate values. Um, so our corporate values are centered around curiosity, simplicity, integrity, and gratitude. So curiosity, simplicity, simplicity, integrity, and gratitude. And gratitude. Well, let's let's start on. from the top. Yeah, spot on. So the reason those things are important to us is because they frame the type of business that we want uh, for the future. We don't want something about us. We want our business to be its own entity, its own beast, um, in its own right. Um, and within that. Uh, those values, we've established uh, four corporate pillars, which is the client experience, um, digital first, uh, operational excellence, and people and culture, or people and community rather. And within those pillars, we've got a range of uh, initiatives that we're looking to roll out. Um, It's about prioritizing them right now. Um, But in terms of people and community, we've got a staff member, he's a young solicitor, Mitch, um, who does fantastic work for us, but he's got a a side uh, dog charity. Um, So we'll be looking to support that. Um, Our initial thoughts are our pharmacy uh, client base do a fantastic job of helping out um, the elderly, uh, typically. So we would like all areas covered, so we will make a push into helping out children and underprivileged children. Um, and that's really important to us as well. But this is something that's forever evolving, uh, and, and we're looking to um, roll that out. But we need and, to get these corporate pillars right. So no, it's all right. And and when did you get these pillars? Because sometimes without direction and priorities, it is it's just it's just busy and crazy. Um, yep. And how long have you had the pillars uh, for? Did anyone help you um, uh, on that journey? Yeah, so um, a good uh, friend of mine um, from KPMG has uh, indirectly assisted us uh, through this process. We felt that it was really important to get this right now um, because as we continue to grow um, to potentially 300 staff, that's going to be a very hard ship to move if we haven't got this stuff right now. So we're at a, a, a nice little moment in the evolution of our business where we can really get this right. Absolutely. I can tell you, uh, you get you get capacity constraints at around 10 people in a business. Yeah. 
Because up to 10, the charisma of the lead the lead singer can, can drag it forward. And then you normally have a crisis of confidence around that 30 when yep. the lead singer realizes no matter how much revenue they, they write, they're still going to pay bills and you need to do it. And I think that potentially uh, your grouping has, has um, uh, leapfrogged that 30 capacity hurdle um, by by bringing in the smarts of, of the AZ team, but also bringing together the, the four or five pillars. But if I put my VBP hat on, the next one is 100 and 300. And what gets you there doesn't get you forward after that. Um, right. Because words matter the bigger yeah. you get and right. your ability to communicate. And you realize that, that when you speak, to it to anyone that that lots of people are analyzing you what you're talking about so so the corporate communications internally is arguably more important than than what you say to the clients because the clients end up being the the fixed part of the business and your yeah. own team end up being the variable it's funny yeah. how that switches so that's just my my anecdotal kind of thing and and you know we'd love to see you guys get get to 300 now um when when you uh, mention that you've, you do surveys, uh, you've got charitable programs, um, it sounds like you'd be a classic candidate to put yourself up for the great place to work in Australia. Is that something that you guys have looked into? That's right. So that's one of our in- initiatives um, that we're putting together. Uh, and uh, we have never done it before. Um, so we'll go through that process. Oh, but, so you're doing uh, it now. Is that what you say? Uh, we're about to, yeah. Okay. So that, that's oh, cool. something Pasquale, Pasquale would drive. So that's very exciting. Yeah, well, as, as, as someone who's been through the process, it's awesome. Okay, yep. Rain, Hale, or Sean, it's, um, uh, you know, you mentioned the word accountability. It's all good and we're yeah. having accountability on the numbers. But if you're yes. not accountable for um, the, 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 the people, then, then you're in trouble. And I think you mentioned that you did a survey and, and people are saying they're a bit overworked. Um, yep. You know, if I had a dollar, that's kind of, um, uh, I think that, that, most people engage my, one of my other businesses, which which supplies yeah. global talent, um, because they think that uh, we're going to be able to do a lot more things for them. But the first step is actually we just help their existing people, <laughs> you know, get their workload under control and, and, and avoid them kind of sending you the Dear John letter, which is which is terrible because you don't lose, you know, the real smart. So, um, yeah. No, exactly. Well, well, good, good <laughs> luck with that one there. Um, and uh, when... I wanted to also just just go back to when you're recruiting people. So, are you actively recruiting people at the moment, David, in your business? We are. Um, so, we're always on the hunt for great people. I know it sounds uh, it's a cliche. Um, well, no one's on the hunt for bad people, so that's yeah, never been no, said in this yeah. <laughs> in any forum. So, so there's, there's hunting happening. <laughs> yeah, it, it, exactly. And what we often find is when you need someone, it's often hard to find them at that time. So, we're constantly on the search. Um, and uh, we, we've got a bit of a, a database um, that we're kind of putting together and positions that we think um, need filling. Um, w- we are looking for, for instance, an associate at the moment within the wealth management business uh, just to help with uh, a bit of the workload and potentially one day help establish a new pod, right? So we do have a bit of an evolution there where we invest in some uh, graduates um, and we've got a great team uh, of young graduates coming through. But yeah, the pursuit for for talent it's it's ongoing. We don't want to be reactionary when we're finding people. Ultimately. Yeah, well, uh, look, that's that's the million dollar question, and 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 having graduates um, come in. Look, you're going to do yourselves uh, an, uh, a lot of favors if you if you're adhering to, you know, those pillars of curiosity, simplicity, gratitude. Yep. Um, the the hierarchical requirements of why people work is 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 you know money's one of them, but it's not the only thing. You mentioned the environment. Um, yeah. the the way in which you you, you interact with everyone. We've, I've mentioned, uh, I've asked a few other questions, but when you actually do succeed, how, how do you reward yourself? Well, what's fun in Yarra Lane? How does that work? Yeah, so we do have some fantastic social events within the business, um, and, and I'll tie in, in with uh, reward. But um, things like we have air fry of Wednesdays. You know, the staff get together, they all bring in their frozen food, and we get it into the air fryers. Um, every couple of months, we get a bit of a, a get together um, where we put on a few drinks and uh, we socialise. But um, yeah, look, it's, it's been a fantastic start to the year, and we're looking to take um, the staff to um, a, a winery, um, which will be uh, fantastic. So 
Um, I think sharing in the success um, will be uh, really important. That's how um, we celebrate. We do have a bonus um, share scheme uh, as well. Um, so we, we just try and tie everyone into what we're ultimately trying to do and sharing the spoils and sharing the success. Yeah, sharing in the game. So does that mean that you're relatively transparent with the financials ac- across the group in different data points? Yeah, we are. And we're becoming increasingly uh, uh, transparent um, in a sense. Sometimes too much detail can be, uh, we, we think the num- we, we live and breathe the numbers. Um, sometimes people just want the high level stuff. So we're just trying to get the messaging right. Um, but we're, we're trying to be as transparent as possible. Um, and uh, I think we just got our staff get it um, when they understand what's going on. And one thing that um, my business coach, now business partner, Dave Carney, um, implemented in, in a business was the great game of business, which is uh, not a new scenario. And uh, it's it's kind of where you share the, the numbers and people get a share in uh, the profits over and above the a requirement. Well, that's the outcome. But the process is that the different people in different divisions own a line in the P&L. So if you're on the revenue side, you own a line. And that's pretty typical. But also if you're on the cost side, you own a line as well. And so al- although... You know, when you add up all those lines, there is a lot. The reality is each individual is only really focused on the thing that they can control. Um, and, uh, you know, if you haven't looked into that, I'd, I'd recommend just, just sort of looking that up and, and, and rolling with it because it's, it's made a big difference, mainly to the people on the cost side because historically yeah. they've been left out of these kind of conversations because, you, you know, it's point. been all about the top line, right? So, yeah, that's some um, said. Now, given your, you know, your 20-odd years, I think you started mm-hmm. uni in 2003. You're 20 odd years into this. You're not a spring chicken anymore, um, but you still look it. You know, it's, uh, which which uh, on a podcast, everyone gets a real fit, real feel for how people are looking. Um, and your clients uh, are not a passing fad. Um, you know, the the aging of Australians and 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 uh, is going to call for more and more sort of assistance in pharmaceutical mm-hmm. and. There's no doubt that if, if, if you wanted to pivot into other allied uh, medical um, areas, you have the credibility to do so. So, you know, that you keep that up your sleeve. But what's, what's your vision, vision for the future? Because this podcast is very much engine room practice manager. And mm-hmm. I've spoken to quite a few people, and some people have come through the administration side of a, of a practice, and they've, 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 they've ended up being head of operations, then GM or, 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 or PM. And some people like yourself have come from the advisory side. Is it something that, you know, where do you see the future for practice managers? And do you feel there's just a big gap in the whole industry around, you know, training, grooming, mentoring people for that role? It is. It's in terms of the commonality amongst those people, I'm not sure what that is just yet. We, we like to think, we, we avoided things like uh, timesheets. Um, because we wanted our staff to be uh, collaborative and have this real culture of helping each other out. Um, I think internally we are sourcing a lot of practice managers, um, really holistic, um, willing to assist style people. We, we don't exist unless we have those type of people. Um, so we're looking to expand and flesh that out as much as possible in terms of the future. Does it matter? Does it matter if they're mortgage-based or... or, or- no. Legal, or, or or is it is it more just around how they arrange themselves and, and communicate? It's spot on, and, and our business is full of people that where um, it doesn't matter what your background is, um, you can still play a role in, in that practice manager uh, position. Uh, I don't know to, to use a probably a corny reference, but probably a bit like the early explorers. You don't quite know how it's all going to look, um, but you know you're probably on the right path to somewhere. Um, but yeah, as long as we keep investing in our people, um, I, I think we'll get the right um, mix of individuals. And Yarra Lane feels like it's been a lot in the last three years and you have had COVID at the same time. But if if, if people are out there listening, what is the specific, you know, are, are you guys, you mentioned that you're in the market for, you just said, practice management. Um, you, you you have a, a, a bit of a history in bringing graduates through, so that's obviously in their PY, et cetera. Um, are you interested in more acquisitions? You know, what's what's kind of uh, – where, where do you sit right now? And if, I, if I'm listening to this and I liked 
what I hear. Um, yeah, what's what's the the appetite at the moment for Yarra Lane? Look, we've grown uh, through acquisitions. Our focus uh, at the moment is on the operational side and making sure everything's breaded down and everything's running as smoothly as possible. Um, but then we will look to um, go again um, and continue uh, the acquisition. So we are always uh, on the lookout. And as you're probably aware, Roxy, these things don't happen overnight. So you need to have those conversations now um, with people. So we have been um, in discussions with our practices and that's been something that we've always done. Um, so we are definitely looking uh, for businesses that are aligned with ours. We're not solely uh, pharmacy uh, related. Um, we bought a high net wealth uh, business um, last year um, and they've been a fantastic um, part of our business. And what we've actually found is that they get a breath of fresh air where they come into a, a bigger practice that's multidisciplinary. Um, I think financial planners by nature are holistic in their thinking uh, and they've got this ability, which they've never had before, to actually assist in different business lines um, and, and really get great outcomes for clients. Um, so we definitely are on the acquisition path. Um, it's just about finding uh, aligned businesses. Yeah, culturally aligned. And, and what I liken it to, and I'll borrow a, a, a purely Melbourne phrase, is that um, there are a lot of Formula One drivers out there of people who want to talk with clients but if you if you don't have a pit crew that when you pull up puts all four wheels back on if you don't have the ability uh to to be multidisciplined then it's more difficult to service that notwithstanding that they're they're they're, you know what my observation out there in in practices are there are a lot of practices that achieve the same result by being hyper hyper specialized and Mm. and referring to other businesses which which and there are a lot of businesses that are sort of coming at from your perspective and I think the people that struggle the ones that are in between where they haven't worked out that they want to be hyper specialized um, or they haven't worked out that they need to collaborate um, is that a sentiment that you would share? Spot on and we were there so we were a bit in no man's land so we we wanted to ensure that um, we did give this a a good crack and and continue to grow but really hone in on our specialities um, which also includes um, uh, barristers and, you know, e- every six months we give uh, a new young barrister a, a grant um, and we run that every six months and we want to continue doing those type of things um, within our client demographic um, uh, to continue to hone into that those specialisations but also build a corporate profile that uh, attracts other businesses and other people um, to join us. Before we finish up, you are the consummate, a modern day professional. Where we th- thank you very much. You're doing a podcast on your way to a wedding. You're doing this in an Airbnb. <laughs> You've informed yes. me that you're going to a board meeting that'll probably be conducted via via the internet in in the car park. So, um, you know, this is this is financial advice in in 2024, David. It's been a yep. it's been a pleasure to unpack uh, the Yarra Lane um, story. It's been a uh, it's been um, eye-opening um, the 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 speed with which um, you can come together and the size um, mm. that figure of uh, that ambitious figure of three hundred people in your group would 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 make you guys um, one there or thereabouts one of the larger uh, sort of practices in in this country and I wish you yeah. and all of your team you know yeah. are listening to this on behalf of myself and Ensemble in the Engine Room podcast um, all the best cheers thank you very much. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Rocky. Cheers.